So then we go to the bill to rent. And so what this was is, you know, first the institutionals got involved and they sort of hired these builders to build these spec homes for rent, like American Homes for Rent, Starwood, Blackstone, et cetera. And so there'd be whole subdivisions of these things built. And when I went out on the road, it would be really it kind of interesting. You would go to a subdivision that wasn't completed. There'd be one home completed, just one out of like 200. And it would have a little for rent sign <laughs> right in the yard. And so and these were typically in your excerpts. Like, you know, the idea was supposed to be rental, a f- theoretically affordable rental. But then, you know, the institutional started pulling back American Homes for Rent. They've become net sellers, except for one all in the family deal uh, recently between Starwood and Blackstone. But they have stopped this. And, and, And American Homes for Rent has actually sold some of these subdivisions that they were building for rent as single family homes. And so what happened is the institutionals got in, then every, you know, Tom, Dick and Harry wanted to get in as well. And they started this almost like a multi-level marketing thing where, but you would contact a broker and say, Hey, I want one of these long-term rentals, you know, and what that broker would do would go out and find, and you'd read a pamphlet and sight unseen, you would kind of build this for spec. And so that's a lot of what was happening. And now out on the road, what I've seen are tons of these empty subdivisions of this build for rent that is, you know, going to put pressure because then we move to the multifamily, which, you know, construction at this point is the highest since the 70s. And you and I might disagree on this, but we don't have the demographics to support it. And so what you're seeing in a lot of the same cities that have that oversaturation of the short-term rental and the build for rent, because they're the sun built happening cities, they also are getting a ton of delivery of multifamily. And I've got a great schedule and I'll, I'll share it with you later if you'd like to see it for a visual of what those deliveries look like in these cities, which are already sitting at- pre- Apartment complexes. That's correct. Multifamily yeah. apartment complexes. And so um, uh, they're already sitting at a pretty significant above average vacancy even before kind of this multifamily is going to hit at the same time, the built for rent. And at the same time, you're going to have some of this short-term rental. And a lot of people, what they did is they pivoted from long-term rental to short-term rental, especially if they were trying to get financing, because you could use certain technologies in this space like AirDNA, look up a property, and it would say to you, your average daily rent is X and your average occupancy is Y. But the, so one in one of my sub stacks, I do a great example of a property in Kyle, Texas, which happened to be a property one of my mortgage clients has, where it was a second home and likely built for either short-term or long-term rental. But the technology I was using said that they would get $600 a day in Kyle, Texas, which is 22 miles south yeah, of Austin. Yeah, I can't imagine that. That's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. And so- a lot of people were led to believe that they would make a lot of money and the DSCR lenders. I know I know responsible lenders in this space, but they relied on that technology as well and, and really kind of said, OK, what can you make? And so people pivoted from long term rental to short term rental because you can make ten thousand dollars a month theoretically versus, you know, that 2K you might have made with a long term rental. And so that's another component. And then, you know, I talk about the demographics. Okay, well, wait, wait, wait a second. You went back into short-term rentals. Yeah. So I thought we were talking about build for rent. We were. I was just kind of, I just kind of gave an example that that these spaces bleed over. And so as people realize they could get more for a short-term rental, they pivoted to that. And so, you know, that took a lot of the long-term rental off the market, actually. (laughs) And so that bill for rent made a lot of sense as rents were skyrocketing during COVID because people thought that we had a paucity of long-term rental as well. But what had actually happened is people pivoted more to short-term rental. So, yeah. So on the long-term versus short-term rental, most of those short-term rental properties are more expensive properties that don't make sense as long-term rentals. Okay. You know, some of them, yeah. Yeah. I mean, some aren't, but most of them are higher priced and the rent to value ratios aren't good on long-term rentals. And that's why these people are in trouble. Okay. Absolutely. Because they can't get the properties to pencil. Had they purchased a bunch of entry-level houses, you know, they could just turn them into long-term rentals and it wouldn't be a problem. You're absolutely uh, but, right. You know, when you own yep. a $700,000 or $1.5 million Airbnb right. property, 
you can't convert that and make it make sense, not even close. Okay. That's right. So those tiers of the market are going to suffer more because th yeah. they're going to dump a little more inventory into that market. Mm -hmm. But on the build for rent though, Melody, mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to ask you about yeah. is who owns those build for rent properties? I mean, those are institutional owners with big money and, and, you know, are they the ones you're saying are or will be in distress or ferret that out for us a little bit? Well, they've, they've already become net sellers. So these, uh, they got out early 22, but it was your smaller mom and pops that kind of got involved was when I was down in Florida was there recently, you know, talking to someone in this build for rent space and uh, it became local groups, uh, like groups of smaller investors that wanted to do this. Uh, so it just it's how it always goes. The institutional start, and then everybody thinks it's a great idea. They start piling in, and and things were starting to not pencil. And so this gentleman I was speaking to told me he's the lone voice still in the room telling people you got to stop. Like you know, um, and one of the big builders, he was working for an institutional. They were putting like two hundred homes in the ground like every month. Like this was it was a huge factory but it all kind of died down in 22 and those institutions became net sellers and then you had sort of more of your smaller investors uh kind of get involved and those are the ones that i think it, just like i was kind of explaining to you i'm joe schmo i want to buy a long-term rental you know help me find one where can i find one and i gotta tell you these people contact me on Twitter all the time, <laughs> you know, looking to, to invest in this space, looking for that one property that's going to be, you know, their passive income. And so we have a lot of smaller mom and pops that took on leverage in this space. And this is where, you know, I, I wasn't going to talk about demographics, but I can move to mortgage now if, if you want to, because it it kind of plays here. Well, you know, I'm kind of wondering on the, on the build to rent space. Yep. I mean, I guess your point is that those portfolios that the institutional owners purchased are going to not perform very well in terms of appreciation. That's right. But like I always say, people only have three choices, buy, rent, or be homeless. Yep. So if they stay in the renter pool, that'll ultimately put upward pressure on rents. I mean, rents have decelerated a bit, but they've decelerated from like a, a crazy fever pitch. Yeah. So, well, I think uh, that's know. because people misunderstand the inventory picture and how mm -hmm. much of this is out there. And I, I did a great substack called Down and Dirty that goes over the permits how much are slated for build for rent out there. And so when you have the build for rent and the multifamily together, they're going to be competing. And so a lot of the build for rent- When the build, build for rent you're saying is single family homes, that when you say yep, that- Yeah, single family homes, yep. yep. And the multifamily. Uh, so what you're so seeing- big apartment complexes. Apartment yeah. complexes is that in the exurbs, you have a lot of this built for rent kind of farther out, but in, in more, more close to the cities, you have these beautiful luxury multifamily buildings that have, that are just popping up everywhere and, and there's too many of them. And so these people are going to be competing. So your, your multifamily and your bill for rent, as well as any of your short-term rental people that want to stay in the game and maybe are going to list for long-term rental, which we see that. And that's one of the reasons I track all three is kind of how the listings move from listings for sale to listings for rent to short-term rental. And so that's what I think a lot of people are missing is that the inventory is exploding in many, many cities. And again, it's, you know, real estate's local, but then it becomes Inven ultimately a national narrative. Go ahead. In inventory of... Just be specific. Um, about that. So I in, housing inventory. So I'm talking about all housing stock, and a lot of people I think miss this because they talk about one component. They talk about uh, listed for sale versus what's listed for rent versus what's the short term rental, and so they miss that all of this housing stock that's out there because it seemed like it all disappeared because Wall Street bought a lot of it up in 2012, 13, 14. Uh, it didn't disappear. It just went into the long-term rental market. And then ultimately, because those homes for sale were off the market, then our builders started getting involved.